part two chapter seven of en route by jory karl heismans translated by charles keegan paul this librivox recording is in the public domain at seven o'clock just as he was preparing to eat his bread durtal encountered father Etienne. father he said tomorrow is tuesday the time of my retreat has expired and i am going how should i order a carriage for saint landry the monk smiled when the postman brings the letters i can charge him with the commission but let us see are you in a great hurry to leave us no but i would not trespass listen since you are so well broken into the life at la trappe stay here two days more the father procurator must go to settle a dispute at saint landry he will take you to the station in our carriage so you will avoid some expense and the journey hence to the railroad will seem to you less long since there will be two of you durtal accepted and as it rained he went up to his room it is strange he said as he sat down how impossible one finds it in a cloister to read a book one wants nothing one thinks of god by himself and not by the volumes which speak about him mechanically he had taken up from a heap of books one in octavo which he had found on his table the day he took possession of his cell it bore the title manresa or the spiritual exercises of ignatius of loyola he had already run through the work at paris and the pages which he turned over afresh did not change the harsh almost hostile opinion which he had retained of this book the fact is that these exercises leave no initiative to the soul they consider it as a soft paste good to run into a mould they show it no horizon no sky instead of trying to stretch it and make it greater they make it smaller deliberately they put it back into the cases of their wafer box nourish it only on faded trifles on dry nothings this japanese culture of deformed toes which remain dwarf this chinese deformation of children planted in pots horrified durtal who closed the volume he opened another the introduction to the devout life by saint francis de sales certainly he found no need to read it again in spite of its affectations and its good nature at first charming but which ends by making you sick by making the soul sticky with sweets with liqueurs in them and lollipops in a word that work so much praised by catholics was a julep scented with bergamot and ambergris it was like a fine handkerchief shaken in a church in which a musty smell of incense remained but the man himself the bishop saint francis de sales was suggestive with his name was called up the whole mystical history of the seventeenth century and durtal recalled the memories he had kept of the religious life of that time there were then in the church two currents that of the high mysticism as it was called originating from saint teresa and saint john of the cross and this current was concentrated on marie guillon another was that of so-called temperate mysticism of which the adepts were saint francis de sales and his friend the celebrated baroness de chantal it was naturally this second current which triumphed jesus putting himself within the reach of drawing-rooms descending to the level of women of the world a moderate and proper jesus only dealing with the soul of his creature just enough to give it one attraction the more this elegant jesus became all the fashion but madame guillon whose source was above all saint teresa who taught the mystical theory of love and familiar intercourse with heaven raised the opposition of the whole clergy who abominated mysticism without understanding it she exasperated the terrible bossuet who accused her of the fashionable heresy molinism and quietism she refuted unhappy as she was this trouble without much difficulty but he persecuted her for it none the less he was furious against her and had her imprisoned at vincennes revealed himself obstinate surly and atrocious fenelon who tried to conciliate these two tendencies in preparing a small mysticism neither too hot nor too cold a little less lukewarm than that of saint francis de sales and above all things much less ardent than that of saint teresa ended in his turn by displeasing the cormorant of meaux and though he abandoned and denied madame de guillon whose friend he had been for long years he was persecuted and tracked down by bossuet condemned at rome and sent in exile to cambrai and here durtal could not but smile for he remembered the desolate complaints of his partisans weeping for this disgrace representing thus as a martyr this archbishop whose punishment consisted in quitting his post as courtier at versailles to go at last and administer his diocese in which he appeared till then to have never resided this mitred job 
who remained in his misfortune archbishop and duke of cambrai prince of the holy roman empire and rich so unhappy because he was obliged to visit his flock well shows the state of the episcopate under the redundant reign of the great king it was a priesthood of financiers and valets only there was at any rate a certain attraction there was talent in every case while now bishops are not for the most part less intriguing nor less servile but they have no longer either talent or manners caught in part in the fish-pond of bad priests they show themselves ready for everything and turn out to be souls of old usurers low jobbers beggars when you press them it is sad to say it but so it is concluded durtal as for madame guillon he went on she was neither an original writer nor a saint she was only an unwelcome substitute for the true mystics she was presuming and certainly lacked that humility which magnified saint teresa and saint Clare. but after all she burst into a flame she was overcome by jesus above all she was not a pious courtier a bigot softened by a court like the maintenon after all what a time for religion it was all its saints have something formal and restricted wordy and cold which turns me away from them saint francis de sales saint vincent de paul saint chantal no i prefer saint francis of assisi saint bernard saint angela the mysticism of the seventeenth century is all the fashion with its emphatic and mean churches its pompous and icy painting its solemn poetry its gloomy prose but look he said my cell is still neither swept nor set in order and i am afraid that in lingering here i may give some trouble to father Etienne. it rains however too hard to allow of my walking in the wood the simplest thing is to go and read the little office of our lady in the chapel he went down there it was at this hour almost empty the monks were at work in the fields or in the factory two fathers only on their knees before the altar of our lady were praying so absorbedly that they did not even hear the opening of the door and durtal who had placed himself near them opposite the porch which gave upon the high altar saw them reflected in the sheet of glass placed before the shrine of the blessed Guéry. this sheet had indeed the effect of a mirror and the white fathers were in the depths of it lived in prayers under the table in the very heart of the altar and he also appeared there in a corner reflected at the back of the shrine near the sacred remains of the monk at one moment he lifted his head and saw that the round window in the apse behind the altar reproduced on its glass ornamented with grey and blue the marks engraved on the reverse of the medal of saint benedict the first letters of its imperative formulas the initials of its distiches it might have been called an immense clear medal sifting a pale light straining it through prayers not allowing them to penetrate to the altar till sanctified and blessed by the patriarch and while he was dreaming the clock struck the two trappists regained their stalls while the others entered waiting thus in the chapel the hour of sext had struck the abbot advanced durtal saw him again for the first time since their conversation he seemed less ill less pale he marched majestically in his great white cowl at the hood of which hung a violet acorn and the fathers bowed kissing their sleeve before him he reached his place which was designated by a wooden cross standing before a stall and all enfolded themselves with a great sign of the cross bowed to the altar and the feeble imploring voice of the old trappist rose deus in adjutorum meum intende and the office continued in the monotonous and charming pitch of the doxology interrupted by profound reverences large movements of the arm lifting the sleeve of the cowl as it fell to the ground to allow the hand freedom to turn the pages when sext was over durtal went to rejoin the oblate they found on the table of the refectory a little omelette leeks cooked in a sauce of flour and oil haricots and cheese it is astonishing said durtal how in regard to mystics the world errs on preconceived ideas on the old string phrenologists declare that mystics have pointed skulls now here that their form is more visible than elsewhere because they are all hairless and shaven there are no more heads like eggs than anywhere else i looked this morning at the shape of their heads no two are alike some are oval and depressed others like a pear and straight some have lumps on them and some have none and it is just the same with faces when they are not transfigured by prayer they are ordinary if they did not wear the habit of their order no one could recognize in these trappists predestined beings living out of modern society in the full middle ages in absolute dependence on a god 
if they have souls which are not like those of other people they have after all faces and bodies like those of the first comer all is within said the oblate why should elect souls be enclosed in fleshly prisons different to others this conversation which continued on different points of trappist life ended by turning on death in a monastery and m bruneau revealed some details when death is near he said the father abbot traces on the ground a cross in blessed ashes covered with straw and the dying man is placed on it wrapped in serge cloth the brothers recite near him the prayers of the dying and at the moment of his death the response subvenite sancti dei is chanted in choir the father abbot incenses the body which is washed while the monks sing the office of the dead in another room then his regular habit is put on the dead monk and he is borne in procession to the church where he lies on a stretcher with his face uncovered until the hour destined for the funeral then on the way to the cemetery the community intones no longer the chant of the dead the psalms of grief and the sequences of regret but rather in exitu israel de aegypto which is the psalm of deliverance the free song of joy and the trappist is buried without a coffin in his robe of stuff his head covered with his hood lastly during thirty days his place remains empty in the refectory his portion is served as usual but the brother porter distributes it to the poor ah the happiness to die thus said the oblate as he ended for if one dies after having honestly fulfilled one's task in the order one is assured of eternal happiness according to the promises made by our lord to saint benedict and to saint bernard the rain is over said durtal i should like to visit to-day that little chapel at the end of the park of which you spoke to me the other day which is the shortest way to reach it Monsieur bruno told him the way and durtal went off rolling a cigarette to gain the great pond thence he struck a path to the left and mounted a lane of trees he slipped on the wet ground and got on with difficulty at last however he gained a clump of chestnuts which he skirted behind these rose a dwarf tower topped by a very small dome pierced by a door to the left and right of this door on sockets where ornaments of the romanesque epoch still were seen under the velvety crust of moss two stone angels were still standing they belonged evidently to the burgundian school with their big round heads their hair puffed and divided into waves their fat faces with turned-up noses their solid draperies with hard folds they also came from the ruins of the old cloister but the interior of the chapel was unfortunately thoroughly modern it was so small that the feet of him who knelt at the altar almost touched the wall at the entrance in a niche veiled by white gauze a virgin smiled with extended hands she had blue plaster eyes and apple-shaped cheeks she was wearisome in her insignificance but her sanctuary retained the warmth of places always shut up the walls hung with red calico were dusted the floor was swept and the holy water basins full superb tea roses flourished in pots between the candelabra durtal then understood why he had so often seen m bruneau walking in this direction with flowers in his hand he was going to pray in this place which he loved no doubt because it was isolated in the profound solitude of this trappist monastery excellent man cried durtal thinking over the affectionate services the fraternal care the oblate had had for him and he added he is a happy man too for he is self-contained and lives so placidly here and indeed he went on where is the good of striving if not against oneself to agitate oneself for money for glory to conduct oneself so as to keep others down and gain adulation from them how vain a task only the church in decking the temporary altars of the liturgical year in forcing the seasons to follow step by step the life of christ has known how to trace for us a plan of necessary occupations of useful ends she has given us the means of walking always side by side with jesus to live day by day with the gospels for christians she has made time the messenger of sorrows and the herald of joys she has entrusted to the year the part of servant of the new testament the zealous emissary of worship and durtal reflected on the cycle of the liturgy which begins on the first day of the religious year with advent then turns with an insensible movement on itself till it returns again to its starting point to the time when the church prepares by penitence and prayer to celebrate christmas and turning over his prayer book seeing the extraordinary circle of offices he thought of that prodigious jewel that crown of king ressesvant preserved in the museum of cluny 
the liturgical year was like it studded with crystals and jewels by its admirable canticles and its fervent hymns set in the very gold of benedictions and vespers it seemed that the church had substituted for that crown of thorns with which the jews had surrounded the temples of the saviour the truly royal crown of the proper of the seasons the only one which was chiselled in a metal precious enough with art pure enough to dare to place itself on the brow of a god and the grand lapidary had begun his work by encrusting in this diadem of offices the hymn of saint ambrose and the invocation taken from the old testament the rorate Curly, that melodious chant of expectation and regret that obscure gem violet coloured the lustre declares itself then when after each of its stanzas rises the solemn prayer of the patriarchs calling for the longed-for presence of christ and the four sundays of advent disappeared with the turned pages of the prayer book the night of the nativity was come after the jesu redemptor of vespers the old portuguese chant the adeste fideles arose at benediction from every lip it was a sequence of a truly charming simplicity an old carving wherein defiled the shepherds and the kings to a popular air appropriate to great marches apt to charm to aid by the somewhat military rhythm of its steps the long lines of the faithful quitting their cottages to go to the distant churches in the towns and imperceptibly like the year in an invisible rotation the circle turned and stopped at the feast of the holy innocents where there flourished out like a flower from a slaughter-house on a shoot culled from a soil irrigated by the blood of lambs this sequence red and smelling of roses the salvete flores martyrum of prudentius the crown moved again and the hymn of the epiphany the crudelis herodes of sedulius appeared in its turn now the sundays grew heavy the violet sundays when the gloria in excelsis is no more heard when the audi benigne of saint ambrose is chanted and the miserere that cinder-coloured psalm which is perhaps the most perfect masterpiece which the church has ever drawn from her storehouses of plain chants it was lent when the amethysts fade in the moist grey of onyxes in the embrowned white of quartz and the magnificent invocation attende domine rose beneath the arches sprung like the rorate coeli from the sequences of the old testament this humble and contrite chant enumerating the deserved punishments of sins became if not more sorrowful at all events more grave and more pressing when it confirmed when it resumed in the initial stanza of its burthen the avowal of shame already confessed and suddenly on this crown there burst out after the expiring fires of lent the flaming ruby of the passion on the upturned yellow of the sky a red cross was raised while majestic shouts and despairing cries proclaimed the blood-stained fruit of the tree and the vexilla regis was again repeated the following sunday at the feast of palms which joined to that sequence of fortunatus the green hymn which it accompanied with a silky noise of palms the gloria laus et honor of theodulf then the fires of precious stones grew grey and died to the glowing coals of gems succeeded the dead cinders of obsidians black stones scarcely swelling without a gleam above the tarnished gold of their mountings one ended now holy week everywhere the pange lingua and the stabat mater wailed under the arches and then came the tenebrae the lamentations and the psalms whose knell shook the flame of the brown waxen tapers and after each halt at the end of each of the psalms one of the tapers expired and its column of blue smoke evaporated still under the lighted circumference of the arches while the choir recommenced the interrupted series of complaints and the crown turned once more the beads of this musical rosary still ran on and all changed jesus had risen and songs of joy issued from the organs the victimae pascale laudes exulted before the gospel of the masses and at the benediction of the ophilii et filii created indeed to be intoned by the wild jubilation of crowds ran and sported in the joyous hurricane of the organs which uprooted the pillars and unroofed the naves and the feasts rung in with bells followed at longer intervals at ascension the heavy and clear crystals of saint ambrose filled with their luminous water the tiny basin of the gem sockets the fire of rubies and garnets were lighted up again with the crimson hymn and scarlet sequence of pentecost the veni creator and veni spiritus the feast of the trinity passed signalized by the stanzas of gregory the great and for the feast of the blessed sacrament the liturgy could exhibit the most marvellous jewel case of its dower 
the office of saint thomas the pange lingua the adoro te the sacre solemnis the verbum supernum and above all the lauda sion that pure masterpiece of latin poetry and scholasticism that hymn so precise so lucid in its abstraction so firm in its rhymed words round which is rolled the melody perhaps the most enthusiastic the most supple in plain chant the circle displaced itself again showing on its different faces the twenty-three to twenty-eight sundays which defile after pentecost the green weeks of the time of pilgrimage and stopped at the last feast at the sunday after the octave of all saints at the dedication of churches which the caelistis urbs incensed old stanzas of which the ruins were badly consolidated by the architects of urban eight old jewels on which the troubled water slept and was reanimated only in rare lights the juncture of the religious crown of the liturgical year was then made at the masses in which the gospel of the last sunday after pentecost the gospel according to st matthew repeats as well as the gospel according to st luke recited on the first sunday in advent the terrible predictions of christ on the desolation of the time on the end of the world this is not all durtal continued who was interested in this run through his prayer book in this crown of the proper of the seasons are inserted like smaller stones the sequences of the proper of saints which fill the empty places and finish the round of the circle first the pearls and gems of the blessed virgin the limpid jewels the blue sapphires and rose rubies of her antiphons then the aquamarine so lucid and pure of the ave maris stella the topaz pale as tears of the o quot undis lacrimarum on the feast of the seven dolours the hyacinth colour of dried blood of the stabat then were told the feasts of the angels and the saints the hymns dedicated to the apostles and the evangelists to the martyrs whether solitary or in couples both out of and during the pascal season to the confessors pontiffs and non-pontiffs to virgins to holy women all feasts differentiated by special sequences by special proses of which some are very simple like those stanzas made in honour of the nativity of st john the baptist by paul the deacon there still remains all saints with the placare Christe and the three blows on the alarm bell the knell in triplets of the dies irae which resounds on the day set apart for the commemoration of the dead what an immense fund of poetry what an incomparable estate of art the church possesses he cried closing his book and many memories rose for him at this excursion into his prayer book on how many evenings had the sadness of life been dissipated in listening to these proses chanted in the churches he thought over again of the suppliant voice of advent and recalled one evening when he had wandered under a fine rain along the quays he had been driven from home by ignoble visions and at the same time had been harassed by the increasing disgust of his vices he had ended by being brought up against his will at saint gervais in the chapel of the virgin some poor women were prostrate he had knelt tired and dazed his soul so ill at ease that he slumbered without power to wake himself some men and boys of the choir were installed in the chapel with two or three priests they had lighted candles and the voice light and sustained of a child had in the dark of the church chanted the long antiphons of the rorate in the state of overwhelming sadness in which he was stagnant durtal felt himself open and bleeding to the bottom of his soul then a voice older and less trembling which understood the words it said narrated ingenuously almost without confusion to the just one peccavimus et facti sumus tanquam immundus nos and durtal took up these words and spelt them over in terror thinking ah yes we have sinned and become like the leprous o lord and the chant continued and in his turn the most high borrowed that same innocent organ of childhood to declare to man his pity and to confirm to him the pardon assured by the coming of the sun and the evening had ended by the benediction in plain chant in the midst of the silence and prostration of unhappy women durtal remembered how he left the church refreshed freed from his hauntings and he had gone away in the drizzling rain surprised that the way was so short humming the rorate of which the air had taken possession of him ending by seeing in it the personal touch of a kindly unknown and there were other evenings the octave of the feast of all souls at saint sulpice and at saint thomas aquinas where after the vespers of the dead they brought out again the old sequence which has disappeared from the roman breviary the languentibus in purgatorio 
this church was the only one in paris which had retained these pages of the gallican hymnal and had them sung by two basses without a choir but these singers so poor as a rule no doubt were fond of this air for if they did not sing it without at least they put a little soul into its delivery and this invocation to the madonna in which she was adjured to save the souls in purgatory was as sorrowful as the souls themselves and so melancholy so languid that the surroundings were forgotten the ugliness of that sanctuary of which the choir was a theatre scene surrounded by closed dressing-rooms and garnished with lustres one might think oneself for a few moments far from paris far from that population of devout women and servant girls which attend that place in the evening ah the church he said to himself as he descended the path which led to the great pond what a mother of art is she and suddenly the noise of a body falling into the water interrupted his reflections he looked behind the hedge of reeds and saw nothing but great circles running on the water and all at once in one of these rings a small dog-like head appeared holding a fish in its mouth the beast raised itself a little out of the water showed a thin body covered with fur and gazed on durtal quietly with its little black eyes then in a flash it passed the distance which separated it from the bank and disappeared under the grasses it is the otter he said to himself remembering the discussion at table between the stranger priest and the oblate and he went to gain the other pond when he encountered father etienne he told him his adventure impossible cried the monk no one has ever seen the otter you must have mistaken it for a water rat or some other animal for that beast for which we have watched for years is invisible durtal gave him a description of it it is certainly the otter admitted the guest master surprised it was evident that this otter lived in the pond in a legendary state in monotonous lives in days like those in a cloister it took the proportions of a fabulous subject of an event whereof the mystery would occupy intervals seized between prayers and offices we must point out to m bruno the exact spot where you remarked it for he will begin to hunt it again said father etienne after a silence but how can it trouble you in eating your fish since you do not angle for them i beg your pardon we fish for them to send them to the archbishop answered the monk who went on still it is very strange that you saw the beast when i leave this thought durtal they will certainly speak of me as the gentleman who saw the otter while talking they had arrived at the cross pond look said the father pointing out the swan who rose in a fury beat his wings and hissed what is the matter with him the matter is that the white hue of my habit infuriates him ah and why i do not know perhaps he wants to be the only one who is white here he spares the lay brothers while as for a father wait you will see and the guest master walked quietly towards the swan come he said to the angry creature who splashed him with water and he held out his hand which the swan snapped see said the monk showing the mark of a red pinch printed on the flesh and he smiled holding his hand and quitted durtal who asked himself whether in acting thus the trappist were not wishing to inflict on himself some corporal punishment to atone for some distraction the evening before some peccadillo that stroke of the beak must have pinched him horribly for the tears came into his eyes how could he expose himself with joy to such a bite and he remembered that one day at the office of none one of the young monks made a mistake in the tone of an antiphon at the moment that the office ended he knelt before the altar then he lay his whole length on the tiles on his face his mouth pressed on the ground till the stroke of the prior's bell gave him the order to get up this was a voluntary punishment for a negligence committed a forgetfulness who knows whether father etienne did not in his turn punish himself for a thought he deemed to border on sin in getting himself thus pinched he consulted the oblate on the point in the evening but m bruno contented himself with a smile without answering and when durtal spoke to him of his speedy departure for paris the old man shook his head considering he said the fear and the discomfort that communion caused you you would act wisely if you approached the holy table immediately on your return and seeing that durtal did not reply but hung his head believe a man who has known these trials if you do not force yourself while you are still under the warm impression of la trappe you will float between desire and regret without advancing you will be ingenious in discovering excuses for not making your confession you will try to think it impossible to find in paris an abbe who understands you 
now allow me to assure you nothing is more false if you desire an expert and easy confident go to the jesuits if you wish above all a zealous souled priest go to saint sulpice you will find there honest and intelligent ecclesiastics excellent hearts in paris where the clergy of the parishes are so mixed they are at the top of the basket of the priesthood and as may be imagined they form a community live in cells do not dine out and as the sulpician rule forbids them to aspire to honours or places they do not run the chance of becoming bad priests by ambition do you know them no but to resolve that question which in fact constantly troubles me i count on a priest whom i often see on the very man who in fact sent me into this trappist monastery and that he went on makes me remember and he rose to go to compline that i have as yet forgotten to write to him it is true that now it is too late i should arrive at his house almost as soon as my letter it is strange but by force of walking in one's own by force of living to oneself the days run by and there is no time to do anything here end of part two chapter seven part two chapter eight of en route by jory karl heismans translated by charles keegan paul this librivox recording is in the public domain he had hoped for his last day at la trappe a morning of quiet when his mind might lounge a mixture of spiritual siesta and of working charmed by a round of officers and not at all that the idea persistent and obstinate that he must quit the monastery next day would spoil all the pleasures he had promised himself now that he had no longer to cleanse himself and pass under the winnowing of confession to present himself for the communion in the morning he remained irresolute not knowing any longer how to occupy his time terrified by the recommencement of that life of the world which would upset all the barriers of forgetfulness and would get at him at once above all the broken defences of the cloister like a captured animal he began to rub against the bars of his cage made the tour of the enclosure filling his sight with those places where he had tasted hours so kindly and so cruel he felt in himself a shaking of the ground a disturbance of soul an absolute discouragement before the prospect of re-entering into his habitual existence of mixing himself anew with the coming and going of men and he experienced at the same time a great fatigue of brain he dragged himself along the walls in a state of complete discomfort in one of those attacks of religious spleen which determine while they last during years the taedium vitae of the cloisters he had a horror of any life but this and the soul overwrought by prayers was failing in a body insufficiently rested and ill-nourished it had no further desire asked only to be let alone to sleep to fall into one of those states of torpor in which everything becomes indifferent in which one ends by losing consciousness gently by being stifled without suffering he might well to react on him as a consolation promise himself to assist in paris at the offices of the benedictine nuns that he would keep himself on the outskirts of society to himself and he was at once obliged to answer that these subterfuges are impossible that the very movement of the town is against all decoys that isolation in a chamber is in no degree like the solitude of a cell that masses celebrated in a chapel open to the public cannot be likened to the private offices of the trappists then what is the good of trying to misunderstand it is with the soul as with the body which is better on the seashore or in the mountains than shut up in a town there is a better spiritual air even at paris in certain religious quarters of the left bank than in the districts situated on the other bank more lively in certain churches more pure for example at notre dame des victoires than in churches such as la trinité and the madeleine but the monastery was as it were the true shore and high plateau of the soul there the atmosphere was balsamic strength returned lost appetite for god was there recovered there was health succeeding weakness a regimen fortified and sustained instead of languor and the restricted exercises of the towns the conviction that no trickery was possible to him at paris brought him to the ground he wandered from cell to chapel from chapel to woods awaiting the dinner hour with impatience in order to be able to speak to someone for in his disorder a new need arose for more than a week he had spent the whole afternoon without opening his lips 
he did not suffer from it was even satisfied with his silence but since he was pressed by this idea of departure he could not keep silence any longer thought aloud in the walks to assuage the sensations of his swelling heart that stifled him m bruno was too sagacious not to guess the uneasiness of his companion who became by turns taciturn and over talkative during the meal he made however as though he saw nothing but after he had said grace he disappeared and durtal who was strolling near the great pond was surprised to see him coming in his direction with father Etienne. they greeted him and the trappist with a smile proposed to him if he had made no other plan to pass his time in visiting the convent and especially the library which the father prior would be delighted to show him if convenient to me i shall be delighted cried durtal all three returned towards the abbey the monk lifted the latch of a little door fashioned in a wall near the church and durtal entered a minute cemetery planted with wooden crosses on grass graves there was no inscription no flower in this enclosure which they traversed the monk pushed another door which opened on a long corridor smelling of rats at the end of this gallery durtal recognized the staircase he had ascended one morning for his confession in the prior's room they left it on their right turned into another gallery and the guest-master led them into an immense hall pierced by high windows decorated with eighteenth-century pier-glasses and grisailles it was furnished only with benches and stalls above which was a single chair sculptured and painted with abbatial arms which marked the place of don anselme oh this chapter-house has nothing monastic said father etienne designating the profane pictures on the walls we have kept just as it was the drawing-room of this old chateau but i beg you to believe that this decoration hardly pleases us and what takes place in this hall well we meet here after mass the chapter opens by reading the martyrology followed by the concluding prayers of prime then we read a passage from the rule and the father abbot comments on it lastly we practice the exercise of humility that is to say that whoever among us has committed any fault against the rule prostrates himself and avows it before his brethren they went thence to the refectory this room had also a high ceiling but was smaller and garnished with tables in the form of a horseshoe a kind of large cruets each containing two half bottles of wine and water separated by a water bottle and before them instead of glasses cups of brown earthenware with two handles were placed at equal distances the monk explained that these sham cruets with three branches indicated the place of two covers each monk having a right to his half bottle of drink and partaking with his neighbour the water in the bottle this pulpit said father etienne pointing out a large wooden box fixed against the wall is destined for the reader of the week the father who reads during the meal how long does the meal last just half an hour yes and the cookery which we eat is delicate in comparison with that which is served to the monks said the oblate i should lie if i were to affirm that we make good cheer answered the guest master do you know that the hardest thing to bear in the earlier time especially is the want of seasoning in our dishes pepper and spices are forbidden by our rule and as no salt cellar has place in our table we swallow our food just as it is and it is for the most part scarcely salted on certain days in summer when one sweats in big drops this becomes almost impossible the gorge rises yet one must begin upon this warm paste and at least swallow a sufficient quantity not to give out before the next day we look at each other discouraged unable to get any further there is not another word to define our dinner in the month of august it is a punishment and all the father abbot the prior the fathers the brethren have the same food all now come and see the dormitory they ascended to the first floor an immense corridor furnished like a stable with wooden boxes extended before them closed at each end by a door this is our lodging said the monk as he stopped before one of these cases cards were placed on them affixing the name of each monk and the first bore a ticket with this inscription the father abbot durtal felt the bed against one of the two walls it was as rough as a carding comb and as biting as a file it was composed of a simple quilted paillasse extended on a plank no sheets but a prison coverlet of grey wool a sack of straw instead of pillows god it is very hard said durtal and the monk laughed our habits soften the roughness of this straw mattress 
he said for our rule does not allow us to undress we may only take off our shoes therefore we sleep entirely clad our head wrapped in our hood and it must be cold in this corridor swept by all the winds added durtal no doubt the winter is rough here but it is not that season which alarms us we live pretty well even without fire in time of frost but the summer if you knew what it is to wake in habits still steeped in sweat not dried since the evening before it is terrible then though because of the great heat we have often hardly slept we must before dawn jump out of bed and begin at once the great night office the vigils which last at least two hours even after twenty years of trappist life one cannot but suffer at that getting up in chapel you fight against sleep which crushes you you sleep while you hear a verse chanted you strive to keep awake in order to be able to chant another and fall asleep again one ought to be able to turn the key on thought and one is incapable of it truly i assure you that even beyond the corporal fatigue which explains that state in the morning there is then an aggression of the demon an incessant temptation to make us recite the office badly and you all undergo this strife all and this does not hinder concluded the monk whose face was radiant this does not hinder us from being very happy here because all these trials are nothing beside the deep and intimate joys which our good god gives us ah he is a generous master he pays us a hundredfold for our poor sorrows as they spoke they had passed through the corridor and had arrived at its other end the monk opened the door and durtal was astounded to find himself in a vestibule just opposite his own cell i did not think he said that i was living so near you this house is a regular labyrinth but monsieur bruno will take you to the library where the father prior is waiting for you for i must go to my business we shall meet presently he said with a smile the library was situated on the other side of the staircase by which durtal reached his chamber it was large furnished with shelves from top to bottom occupied in the middle by a sort of counter table on which also were spread rows of books father maximin said to durtal we are not very rich but at any rate we possess tools for work fairly complete on theology and the monography of the cloisters you have superb volumes cried durtal who looked at magnificent folios in splendid bindings with armorial bearings wait here are the works of saint bernard in a fine edition and the monk presented to durtal enormous volumes printed in heavy letters on crackling paper when i think that i promised myself to make acquaintance with saint bernard in this very abbey which he founded and here i am on the eve of my departure and have read nothing you do not know his works yes scattered fragments of his sermons and of his letters i have run through some selectae mediocres of his works but that is all he is our chief master here but he is not the only one of our ancestors in saint benedict whom the convent possesses said the monk with a certain pride see and he pointed out on the shelves some heavy folios here saint gregory the great venerable bede saint peter damian saint anselm and your friends are there he said following durtal with a glance as he read the titles of the volumes saint teresa saint john of the cross saint magdalene of pazzi saint angela tauler and she who like sister emmerich dictated her conversations with jesus during her ecstasy and the prior took from the range of books in octavo the dialogues of saint catherine of siena that dominican nun is terrible for the priests of her time the monk went on she insists on their misdeeds reproaches them roundly with selling the holy spirit with practising sortilege and with using the sacrament to compose evil charms and there are besides the disorderly vices of which she accuses them in the series concerning the sin of the flesh added the oblate certainly she does not mince her words but she had the right to take up that tone and menace in the name of the lord for she was truly inspired by him her doctrine was drawn from divine sources doctrina eus infusa non acquisita says the church in the bull of her canonization her dialogues are admirable the pages in which god exposes the holy frauds which he sometimes uses to recall men to good the passages in which she treats of the monastic life of that bark which possesses three ropes chastity obedience and poverty and which faces the tempest under the conduct of the holy spirit are delightful 
she reveals herself in her work the pupil of the well-beloved disciple and of saint thomas aquinas one might believe that one heard the angel of the school paraphrasing the last of the evangelists yes said the oblate striking in if saint catherine of siena does not give herself to the high speculations of mysticism if she does not analyze like saint teresa the mysteries of divine love nor trace the itinerary of souls destined to the perfect life she reflects directly at least the conversations of heaven she calls she loves you have read sir her treatises on discretion and prayer no i have read saint catherine of genoa but the books of saint catherine of siena have never fallen into my hands and what do you think of this collection durtal looked at the title and made a face i see that suso hardly delights you i should tell a lie if i assured you that the dissertations of this dominican pleased me first however illuminated the man may be he does not attract me without speaking of the frenzy of his penances what scrupulousness of devotion and narrowness of piety was his think that he could not decide on drinking till he had first as a preliminary divided his beverage into five parts he thought thus to honour the five wounds of the saviour and moreover he swallowed his last mouthful in two gulps to call up before himself the water and the blood which flowed from the side of the word no these sort of things would never enter into my head i would never admit that such practices would glorify christ and remark well that this love of pounding things small this passion for small blessings is found in all his work his god is so difficult to content so scrupulous so meddling that no one would ever get to heaven if they believed what he said this god of his is the fault-finder of eternity the miser of paradise on the whole suso expands himself in impetuous discourses on trifles then what with his insipid allegories his morose colloquy on the nine rocks knocks me down you will however admit that his study on the union of the soul is substantial and that the office of the eternal wisdom which he composed is worth reading i cannot say father i do not now remember that office but i recollect tolerably well the treatise on union with god it seems to me more interesting than the rest but you will admit that it is very short and then saint teresa has also elucidated that question of human renunciation and divine fruition and hang it then come said the oblate with a smile i give up the attempt to make you a fervent reader of the good suso for us said father maximin if we had a little time to work this ought to be the leaven of our meditations the subject of our reading and he took down a folio which contained the works of saint hildegard abbess of the convent of rupertsberg she you see is the great prophetess of the new testament never since the visions of saint john at patmos has the holy spirit communicated to an earthly being with such fullness and light in her heptachronon she predicts protestantism and the captivity of the vatican in her scivias or knowledge of the ways of the lord which was edited according to her recital by a monk of the convent of saint desibod she interprets the symbols of the scriptures and even the nature of the elements she also wrote a diligent commentary on our rules and enthusiastic pages on sacred music on literature on art which she defines admirably a reminiscence half effaced of a primitive condition from which we have fallen since eden unfortunately to understand her it is necessary to give oneself to minute researches and patient studies her apocalyptic style has something retractile which retreats and shuts itself up all the more when one will open it i am well aware that i am losing my little latin said m bruno what a pity there is not a translation of her works with glosses to help they are untranslatable said the father who went on saint hildegard is with saint bernard one of the purest glories of the family of saint benedict how predestinate was that virgin who was inundated with interior light at the age of three and died at eighty-two having lived all her life in the cloister and add that she was as a permanent state prophetical cried the oblate she is like no other woman saint all in her is astonishing even the way in which god addresses her for he forgets that she is a woman and calls her man and she added the prior employs when she wishes to designate herself the singular expression the paltry form but here is another writer who is dear to us and he showed durtal the two volumes of saint gertrude she is again one of our great nuns an abbess truly benedictine in the exact sense of the word 
for she caused the holy scriptures to be explained to her nuns wished that the piety of her daughters should be based on science that this faith should be sustained by liturgical food if i may say so i know nothing of her but her exercises observed durtal and they have left me with the memory of echoed words of things said again from the sacred books so far as one may judge from simple extracts she does not appear to have original expression and to be far below saint teresa or saint angela no doubt answered the monk but she comes near saint angela by the gift of familiarity when she converses with christ and also by the loving vehemence of what she says only all this is transformed on leaving its proper source she thinks liturgically and this is so true that the least of her reflections at once presents itself to her clothed in the language of the gospels and the psalms her revelations her insinuations her herald of divine love are marvellous from this point of view and then her prayer to the blessed virgin is exquisite which opens with this phrase hail o white lily of the trinity resplendent and always at rest as a continuation of her works the benedictine fathers of solem have edited also the revelations of saint mertilde her book on special grace and her light of the divinity they are there on that shelf let me show you said in his turn monsieur bruno guides wisely marked out for the soul which escapes from itself and will attempt to climb the eternal mountains and he handed to durtal the lucerna mystica of lopez esquerra the quartos of scaramelli the volumes of schram the christian asceticism of ribe the principles of mystic theology of father seraphin and do you know this continued the oblate the volume he offered was called on prayer was anonymous and bore at the bottom of its first page solem printed at the abbey of saint cecilia and above the printed date eighteen eighty six durtal made out the word written in ink confidential i have never seen this little book which seems moreover to have never been brought into the market who is the author the most extraordinary nun of our time the abbess of the benedictine nuns at solem i regret only that you are going so soon for i should have been happy to let you read it as far as the document is concerned it is of a most extraordinary science and it contains admirable quotations from saint hildegard and cassien as far as mysticism is concerned mother saint cecilia evidently only reproduces the works of her predecessors and she tells us nothing very new nevertheless i remember a passage which seems to me more special more personal wait and the oblate turned over a few pages here it is the spiritualized soul does not appear exposed to temptation properly so called but by a divine permission it is called upon to conflict with the demon spirit against spirit the contact with the demon is then perceived on the surface of the soul under the form of a burn at once spiritual and sensible if the soul hold good in its union with god if it be strong the pain however sharp is bearable but if the soul commit any slight imperfection even inwardly the demon makes just so much way and carries his horrible burning more forward until by generous acts the soul can repulse him further this touch of satan which produces an almost material effect on the most intangible parts of our being is you will admit at least curious concluded the oblate as he closed the volume mother saint cecilia is a remarkable strategist of the soul said the prior but but this work which she edited for the daughters of her abbey contains i think some rash propositions which have not been read without displeasure at rome to have done with our poor treasures he continued we have only on this side and he pointed out a portion of the bookcases which covered the room long-winded works the cistercian menology minier's patrology dictionaries of the lives of the saints manuals of sacred interpretation canon law christian apology biblical exegesis the complete works of saint thomas tools of work which we rarely employ for as you know we are a branch of the benedictine trunk vowed to a life of bodily labour and penance we are men of sorrow for god above all things here is monsieur bruno who uses these books and so do i at times for i have special charge of spiritual matters in this monastery added the monk with a smile durtal looked at him he handled the volumes with caressing hands brooded over them with the blue lustre of his eye laughed with the joy of a child as he turned their pages what a difference between this monk who evidently adores his books 
and the prior with his imperious profile and silent lips who heard his confession the second day then thinking of all these trappists the severity of their countenances the joy of their eyes durtal said to himself that these cistercians were not at all as the world believed solemn and funereal people but that quite the contrary they were the gayest of men now said father maximin the reverend father abbot has charged me with a commission knowing that you will leave us to-morrow he is anxious now that he is better to pass at least some minutes with you he will be free this evening will it trouble you to join him after compline not at all i shall be glad to talk with don anselme that is understood then they went downstairs durtal thanked the prior who re-entered the enclosure of the corridors and the oblate who went up to his cell he trifled about and in spite of the torment of his departure which haunted him reached the evening without too much trouble the salve regina which he heard perhaps for the last time thus sung by male voices that airy chapel built of sound and evaporating with the close of the antiphon in the smoke of the tapers stirred him to the bottom of his soul the trappist monastery showed itself truly charming this evening after the office they said the rosary not as at paris where they recite a pater ten aves and a gloria and so over again here they said in latin a pater an ave a gloria and began again until in that manner they had finished several decades this rosary was said on their knees half by the prior half by all the monks it went at so rapid a pace that it was scarcely possible to distinguish the words but as soon as it was ended at a signal there was a great silence and each one prayed with his head in his hands and durtal took notice of the ingenious system of conventual prayers after the prayers purely vocal like these came mental prayer personal petitions stimulated and set a-going by the very machine of paternosters nothing is left to chance in religion every exercise which seems at first useless has a reason for its being he said to himself as he went out into the court and the fact is that the rosary which seems to be only a humming top of sounds fulfils an end it reposes the soul wearied with the supplications which it has recited applying itself to them thinking of them it hinders it from babbling and reciting to god always the same petitions the same complaints it allows it to take breath to take rest in prayers in which it can dispense with reflection and in fact the rosary occupies in prayer those hours of fatigue in which one would not pray ah here is the father abbot the trappist expressed to him his regret at visiting him only thus for a few moments then after he had answered durtal who inquired after the state of his health which he hoped was at last re-established he proposed to him to walk in the garden and begged him not to inconvenience himself by not smoking cigarettes if he had a mind to do so and the conversation turned on paris don anselme asked for some information and ended by saying with a smile i see by scraps of newspapers which come to me that society just now is infected with socialism every one wishes to solve the famous social question how does that get on how does that get on why not at all unless you can change the souls of workmen and masters and make them disinterested and charitable between today and tomorrow in what can you expect these systems to end well said the monk enwrapping the monastery with a gesture the question is solved here as wages do not exist all sources of conflicts are suppressed as every task is according to aptitudes and powers the fathers who are not strong-shouldered and big-armed fold the packages of chocolate or make out the bills and those who are robust dig the ground i add that the equality in our cloisters is such that the prior and the abbot have no advantage over the other monks at table the portions and in the dormitory the payasas are identical the sole profits of the abbot consist on the whole in the inevitable cares arising from the moral conduct and the temporal administration of an abbey there is therefore no reason why the workmen of a convent should go on strike concluded the abbot with a smile yes but you are minimists you suppress the family and woman you live on nothing and expect the only real recompense for your labours after death how can you make the people in the towns understand that the social system may thus be summed up as i think the masters wish to profit by the workmen who in their turn desire to be paid as much as possible for as little work as possible well then there is no way out of that exactly and there is the sad part of it for socialism in fact arises from kindly ideas just ideas and will always run up against egotism and gain 
against the inevitable breakers of the sins of man and your little chocolate factory gives you at least some income yes that saves us the abbot was silent for a second then he went on you know sir how a convent is founded i take for example our order a domain and the lands about it are offered the order on condition that it peoples them the order takes a handful of its monks and settles them as a swarm on the soil given to it there its task stops the grain must spring up of itself or to put it differently the trappists severed from their mother house must gain their livelihood and suffice for themselves so when we took possession of these buildings we were so poor that from bread to shoes everything was lacking but we had no anxiety for the future for there is no example in monastic history that providence has not succored abbeys who trusted in it little by little we drew our food from the estate and we learned useful trades now we make our habits and our shoes we reap our wheat and make our bread our material existence is therefore assured but the taxes crush us therefore we have founded this factory of which the report becomes better from year to year in a year or two the building which shelters us and for want of money we have been unable to repair will tumble down but if god then allows generous souls to come to our aid perhaps we shall be in a condition to build a monastery which is the wish of all of us for indeed this hovel with its rooms in confusion and its rotunda chapel is painful to us the abbot was silent again then after a pause he said in a low voice speaking to himself it cannot be denied a convent which has not the look of a cloister is an obstacle to vocations the postulant has need and this is quite natural to mould himself in surroundings which please him to encourage himself in a church which wraps him round in a somewhat sombre chapel and to obtain that result you want the romanesque or gothic style ah oh, yes indeed and have you many novices we have especially many subjects who desire to feel the life of trappists but the greater part do not succeed in supporting our way of life beside even the question of knowing whether the vocation of the beginners is imaginary or real we are from the physical point of view clearly fixed after a fortnight's trial eating vegetables only must crush the most robust constitutions i do not even understand how leading an active life you can bear it the truth is that bodies obey where souls are resolute our ancestors endured the life of the trappists very well we want souls at the present day i remember that when i made my probation in a cistercian cloister i had no health and yet had it been necessary i would have eaten stones moreover the rule will soon be softened pursued the abbot but in any case there is a country which if there should be scarcity assures us a good number of recruits holland and seeing durtal's look of astonishment the father said yes in that protestant country mystic vegetation is flourishing catholicism is all the more fervent that it is if not persecuted at least despised drowned in the mass of calvinists perhaps this belongs also to the nature of the soil to its solitary plains its silent canals to the very taste of the dutch for a regular and peaceable life but in that little knot of catholics the cistercian vocation is always very common durtal looked at the trappist as he walked majestic and quiet his head buried in his hood his hands passed under his cincture from time to time his eyes grew bright inside his hood and the amethyst which he wore on his finger sparkled in brief flames no sound was heard at this hour the monastery was asleep durtal and the abbot were walking on the banks of the great pond where the water was alive it alone wakeful in the slumber of the woods for the moon which shone in a cloudless sky sowed a myriad of goldfish and this luminous spawn fallen from the planet mounted descended sparkled in a thousand little points of fire of which the wind as it blew increased the brightness the abbot spoke no longer and durtal who was thinking intoxicated by the sweetness of the night groaned suddenly he had just considered that at this same hour the next day he would be at paris and seeing the monastery whose pale front appeared at the end of a walk as at the end of a dark tunnel he cried thinking of all the monks who inhabited it oh they are happy and the abbot answered too happy then gently in a low voice yes it is true we enter here to do penance to mortify ourselves and we have hardly begun to suffer when god consoles us he is so good that he himself wishes to deceive himself about our merits if at certain moments he allows the demon to persecute us 
he gives us in exchange so much happiness that there is no proportion preserved between the recompense and the sorrow sometimes when i think of it i ask myself how there still subsists that equilibrium that nuns and monks are charged to maintain since neither of us suffer enough to neutralize the repeated sins of towns the abbot stopped and then went on pensively the world does not even conceive that the austerity of the abbeys can profit it the doctrine of mystical compensation escapes it entirely it cannot represent to itself that the substitution of the innocent for the guilty is necessary when to suffer merited punishment is concerned nor does it explain to itself any more that in wishing to suffer for others monks turn aside the wrath of heaven and establish a solidarity in the good which is a counterweight against the federation of evil god knows moreover with what cataclysms the unconscious world would be menaced if in consequence of a sudden disappearance of all the cloisters the equilibrium which saves it were broken the case has already presented itself said durtal who while listening to the trappist thought of the abbe gevresin and remembered how that priest had expressed himself on the same subject in nearly similar terms the revolution in fact suppressed all convents with one stroke of a pen but i think that the history of that time when so many hucksters were busy is still to be written instead of searching for documents on the acts and even on the persons of the jacobins the archives of the religious orders which existed at that time should be ransacked in working thus at the side of the revolution in sounding its neighbourhood its foundations will be exhumed its causes will be brought to the surface and it will certainly be discovered that in proportion to the suppression of convents monstrous excesses had birth who knows if the demoniacal madness of carrier or marat do not accord with the death of an abbey whose sanctity preserved france for years to be just answered the abbot it is right to say that the revolution destroyed ruins only the rule of incommendam ended by giving the monasteries over to satan it was they alas that by the relaxation of their morals inclined the balance and drew down the lightning on the land the terror was only a consequence of their impiety god whom nothing longer withheld let things take their course yes but how can you now prove the necessity of compensations to a world which wanders out of the way in continued accesses of gain how persuade it that it is an urgent need as a preventive against new crises to shelter towns behind the sacred bulwarks of cloisters after the siege of eighteen seventy paris was wisely sheltered behind an immense net of impregnable forts but is it not also indispensable to surround it with a cincture of prayers to buttress its neighbourhood with conventual houses to build everywhere in its suburbs convents of poor clares carmelites benedictine nuns of the blessed sacrament monasteries which will be in some degree powerful citadels destined to arrest the forward march of the armies of evil certainly the towns have great need of being guaranteed against infernal invasions by a sanitary defence of orders but come sir i must not deprive you of necessary rest i will join you to-morrow before you quit our solitude i have now but to say that you have only friends here and that you will always be welcome i hope that on your side you will keep no unfavourable memory of our poor hospitality and that you will prove it in coming to see us again as they talked they had come in front of the guest-house the father pressed durtal's hands and slowly ascended the stairs sweeping with his robe the silver dust of the steps as he mounted all white in a ray of the moon end of part two chapter eight part two chapter nine of en route by jory karl heismans translated by charles keegan paul this librivox recording is in the public domain durtal wished immediately after mass to visit for the last time that wood through which he had walked in turn so languidly and so rapidly he went at first to the old lime alley whose pale emanations were verily for his spirit what an infusion of their leaves is for the body a sort of very weak panacea a kindly and soothing sedative then he sat down in their shade on a stone bench as he leant forward a little he could see through the moving spaces in the branches the solemn front of the abbey and opposite separated by the kitchen garden the gigantic cross standing before that liquid plan of a church which the pond simulated 
he rose and approached the watery cross of which the sky turned the marble water blue and he contemplated the great crucifix in white marble which towered above the whole monastery and seemed to rise opposite to it as a permanent reminder of the vows of suffering which he had accepted and reserved to himself to change at length into joys the fact is said durtal who thought over again the contradictory declarations of the monks confessing that they led at once the most attractive and the most atrocious life the fact is that the good god deceives them they attain here below paradise while they seek hell there i have myself tasted how strange is existence in this cloister for i have been here almost at the same time very unhappy and very happy and now i feel well the mirage which is already beginning before two days are over the remembrance of the sorrows which then were if i recall them with care greatly above the joys will have disappeared and i shall only recall those interior emotions in the chapel those delicious stolen moments in the morning in the pathways of the park i shall regret the open-air prison of this convent it is curious i find myself attached to it by obscure bonds when i am in my cell there return to me all kinds of memories like those of an ancient race i find myself at once at home again in a place i had never seen i recognize from the first moment a very special life of which nevertheless i know nothing it seems to me that something which interests me which is indeed personal to me passed here before i was born truly if i believed in metempsychosis i might imagine i had been a monk in anterior existences a bad monk then he said smiling at his reflections since i should have been obliged to be reincarnate and to return to a cloister to expiate my sins while thus talking with himself he had passed across a long alley which led to the end of the enclosure and cutting across the road and through the thickets he strayed into the wood of the great pond it was not in motion as on certain days when the wind made hollows in it and swelled it made it flow and return on itself as soon as it touched its banks it remained immovable and was only stirred by the reflections of the moving clouds and of the trees at moments a leaf fallen from the neighbouring poplars swam on the image of a cloud at others bubbles of air came from the bottom and burst on the surface in the reflected blue of heaven durtal looked for the otter but it did not show itself he saw only the swallows which skimmed the water with their wing the dragonflies which sparkled like jewels flashing like the blue flames of sulphur if he had suffered near the cross pond before the sheet of water of the other pond he could only call up the memory of healing hours which he had passed lying on a bed of moss or a couch of dry reeds and he looked at it tenderly trying to fix and carry it away in his memory to relive again in paris shutting his eyes on the bank he pursued his walk and stopped in an alley of chestnuts along the walls above the monastery thence he went into the court in front of the cloister the outbuildings the stables the woodsheds even the pigsties he tried to see brother simeon but he was probably engaged in the stables for he did not appear the buildings were silent the pigs were shut up only some lean cats prowled about in silence scarcely looking when they met each other going each on its own side no doubt seeking some nourishing game which would console them for the eternal meals of vegetable soup served them at the monastery time was getting on he prayed for the last time in the chapel and went to his cell to get his portmanteau ready while putting his things in order he thought of the inutility of decorated rooms he had spent all his money at paris in buying ornaments and books for till now he had detested bare walls but now considering the blank walls of this room he admitted to himself that he had done better between these four whitewashed walls than in his room at paris hung with stuffs suddenly he recognized that la trappe had weaned him from his preferences had in a few days completely upset him the power of such an environment he said to himself a little alarmed at feeling how he was transformed and he thought in buckling his portmanteau i must however go and find father Etienne, or i must settle my account i cannot be altogether a debtor to these good people he went along the corridors and ended by meeting the father in the court he was a little confused how to open the question at the first words the guest master smiled the rule of saint benedict is formal he said we must receive our guests as we receive our lord jesus himself that is to tell you that we cannot exchange our poor care for money and when durtal insisted embarrassed 
if it does not suit you to have partaken of our meagre pittance without paying do as you please only the sum which you may give will be distributed in coins of ten or twenty sous to the poor who come each morning often from a great distance to knock at our monastery gate durtal bowed and handed the money which he had ready in his pocket to the father but he inquired if he might not have a word with father maximin before his departure certainly moreover father prior would not have let you go without shaking hands with you i will go and make certain if he be free wait for me in the refectory and the monk disappeared and came back a few minutes afterwards preceded by the prior ah well said he then you are going to plunge again into the hurly-burly oh without any pleasure father i understand that it is so good is it not no longer to hear anything and to be silent however take courage we will pray for you and as durtal thanked both of them for their kind attentions it is a pleasure to receive a retreat in such as you cried father Essien. nothing repulses you and you are so exact that you are about before the hour you rendered my task of overseer easy if all were as little exacting and as pliable and he admitted that he had given lodging to priests sent by their bishops as a penance ecclesiastics of ill repute whose complaints about food lodging the need of rising early in the morning never ceased if again said the prior one could hope to recall them to good to send them back healed to their parishes but no they go away still more rebellious than before the devil does not let them alone during this conversation a lay brother brought in some dishes covered with plates and placed them on the table we have changed the hour of your dinner because of the train said father Essien. good appetite adieu and may the lord bless you said the prior he raised his hand and enwrapped durtal with a great sign of the cross who knelt surprised at the sudden emotion in the monk's tone but father maximin recovered himself at once and he bowed to him as monsieur bruno entered the meal was silent the oblate was visibly distressed at the departure of the companion whom he loved and durtal looked with a swelling heart at the old man who had so charitably come out of his solitude to give him aid will you not some day come to see me in paris he said no i have quitted life without any mind to return to it i am dead to the world i do not wish to see paris again i have no wish to live again but if god lend me still a few years of existence i hope to see you here again for it is not in vain that one has crossed the threshold of mystic asceticism to verify by one's own experience the reality of the requirements which our lord brings about now as god does not proceed by chance he will certainly finish his work by sifting you as wheat i venture to recommend you to try not to give way and attempt to die in some measure to yourself in order not to run counter to his plans i know well said durtal that all is displaced in me that i am no longer the same but what frightens me is that i am now sure that the works of the theresan school are exact then then if one must pass through the cylinders of the rolling mill which st john of the cross describes the noise of a carriage in the court interrupted him monsieur bruno went to the window and looked out your luggage is down yes they looked at each other listen i would wish indeed to say to you no no do not thank me cried the oblate see i have never so thoroughly understood the misery of my being ah if i had been another man i might by praying better have aided you more the door opened and father Essien declared you have not a minute to lose if you do not wish to miss the train thus hurried durtal had only time to press the hand of his friend who accompanied him to the court he found waiting a sort of open wagon driven by a trappist who below a bald head and cheeks streaked with rose threads had a great black beard durtal pressed the hands of the guest master and the oblate for the last time when the father abbot came in his turn to wish him a safe journey and at the end of the court durtal perceived two eyes fixed on him those of brother anacletus who at a distance said adieu by a slight bow but without other gesture even this poor man whose eloquent look told of a truly touching affection had a saint's pity for the stranger whom he had seen so tumultuous and so sad in the desolate solitude of the wood certainly the stiffness of the rule forbade all show of feeling to these monks but durtal felt thoroughly that for him they had gone to the limit of concessions allowed 
and his affliction was great as he cast them in parting a last expression of thanks and the door of the monastery closed that door at which he had trembled in arriving and at which he now looked with tears in his eyes we must get on fast said the procurator for we are late and the horse went at great speed along the lanes durtal recognized his companion as having seen him in the chapel singing in the choir during the office he had an air at once good-natured and firm and his little grey eye smiled as it glanced behind his branched spectacles well said he how have you borne our regimen i have had every chance i came here with my stomach out of order my body ill and the simple trappist meals have cured me and when durtal narrated briefly the stages of soul he had undergone the monk murmured that is nothing in regard to demoniacal attacks we have had here true cases of possession and brother simeon discovered them ah you know that and he replied quite simply to durtal who spoke to him of his admiration for the poor lay brothers you are right sir if you could talk with these peasants and illiterate men you would be surprised at the often profound answers which these people give you then they alone at the monastery are really courageous we the fathers when we think ourselves too weak accept willingly the authorized addition of an egg they never they pray more and it must be admitted that our lord listens to them since they get well again and indeed are never ill and to a question of durtal who asked him in what consisted the functions of the procurator the monk answered they consist in keeping the accounts in being the commercial agent in travelling in managing alas everything which does not concern the life of the cloister but we are so few in number at notre dame de latre that we become necessarily jacks of all trades for instance father Etienne is cellarer of the abbey and guest-master he is also sacristan and bell-ringer i too am first cantor and professor of plain song and while the carriage rolled along shaken by the ruts the procurator declared to durtal who told him how much the officers chanted at the monastery had delighted him it is not with us that you ought to hear them our choirs are too restricted too weak to be able to raise the giant mass of those chants you ought to go to the black monks of solem or liguge if you wish to find the gregorian melodies executed as they were in the middle ages by the way do you know in paris the benedictine nuns in the rue monsieur yes but do you not think they coo a little i cannot say all the same their collection of tunes is authentic but at the little seminary at versailles you have better still since they chant there exactly as at solem note this well moreover at paris when the churches decline to repudiate liturgical music they use for the most part the false notation printed and spread in abundance in all the dioceses in france by the house of pustet of radisbon but the errors and frauds with which those editions abound are well known the legend on which its partisans rely is incorrect to assert as they do that this version is no other than that of palestrina who was charged by pope paul v to revive the musical liturgy of the church is an argument destitute of truth and void of force for every one knows that when palestrina died he had hardly begun the correction of the gradual i will add that even if that musician had finished his work that would not prove that his interpretation ought to be preferred to that which has been recently constituted after patient researches by the abbey of solem for the benedictine texts are based on the copy preserved at the monastery of st gall of the antiphonary of st gregory which represents the most ancient and the most certain monument which the church preserves of the true plain chant this manuscript of which photographic facsimiles exist is the code of gregorian melodies and it ought to be if i may use the expression the pneumatic bible of choirs the disciples of st benedict are then absolutely right when they declare that their version alone is faithful alone correct how then comes it that so many churches get their music from ratisbon alas how comes it that pustet has so long acquired the monopoly of liturgical books and but no better hold one's peace take this only for certain that the german volumes are the absolute negation of the gregorian tradition the most complete heresy of plain chant by the way what time is it we must make haste said the procurator looking at the watch which durtal held up to him come up my beauty and he whipped up the mare you drive with spirit cried durtal it is true i forgot to say to you that over and above my other functions i also have if need be that of coachman durtal thought all the same that these people were extraordinary who lived an interior life in god 
as soon as they consented to redescend on earth they revealed themselves as the most sagacious and the boldest of business men an abbot founded a factory with the few pence he succeeded in gathering he discerned the employment which suited each of his monks and with them he improvised artisans writing clerks transformed a professor of plain chant into an agent plunged into the tumult of purchases and sales and little by little the house which scarcely was raised above the soil grew put forth shoots and ended by nourishing with its fruit the abbey which had planted it transported into another environment these people would have as easily created great manufactories and started banks and it was the same with the women when one thinks of the practical qualities of a man of business and the coolness of an old diplomatist which a mother abbess ought to possess in order to rule her community one is obliged to admit that the only women truly intelligent truly remarkable are outside of drawing-rooms outside of the world at the head of cloisters and as he expressed his wonder aloud that monks were so expert at setting up business it must be so sighed the father but if you believe that we do not regret the time necessarily spent in digging the ground then our spirit at least was free then we could sanctify ourselves in silence which to a monk is as necessary as bread for it is thanks to it that he stifles vanity as it rises that he represses disobedience as it murmurs that he turns all his aspirations all his thoughts towards god and becomes at last attentive to his presence instead of that but here we are at the station do not trouble yourself about your portmanteau but go and take your ticket for i hear the whistle of the train and in fact durtal had only time to shake hands with the father who put his luggage into the carriage there when he was alone seated looking at the monk as he departed he felt his heart swell ready to break and in the clatter of the rails the train started sharply clearly in a minute durtal took stock of the frightful disorder into which he had thrown the monastery ah and outside it all is the same to me and nothing matters to me he cried and he groaned knowing that he should never more succeed in interesting himself in all that makes the joy of men the uselessness of caring about any other thing than mysticism and the liturgy of thinking about aught else save god implanted itself in him so firmly that he asked himself what would become of him at paris with such ideas he saw himself submitting to the confusion of controversies the cowardice of conventionality the vanity of declarations the inanity of proofs he saw himself bruised and thrust aside by the reflections of everybody obliged henceforward to advance or retire dispute or hold his tongue in any case peace was forever lost how in fact was he to rally and recover when he was obliged to dwell in a place of passage in a soul open to all winds visited by a crowd of public thoughts his contempt for relations his disgust for acquaintances grew on him no everything rather than mix myself again with society he declared to himself and then he was silent in despair for he was not ignorant that he could not apart from the monastic zone live in isolation after a short time would come weariness and a void therefore why had he reserved nothing for himself why had he trusted all to the cloister he had not even known how to arrange the pleasure of entering into himself he had discovered how to lose the amusement of bric-a-brac how to extirpate that last satisfaction in the white nakedness of a cell he no longer held to anything but lay dismantled saying i have renounced almost all the happiness which might fall to me and what am i going to put in its place and terrified he perceived the disquiet of a conscience ready to torment itself the permanent reproaches of an acquired lukewarmness the apprehensions of doubts against faith fear of furious clamours of the senses stirred by chance meetings and he repeated to himself that the most difficult thing would not be to master the emotions of his flesh but indeed to live christianly to confess to communicate at paris in a church he never could get so far as that and he imagined discussions with the abbe gevrasin his gaining time his refusal foreseeing that their friendship would come to an end in these disputes then where should he fly at the very recollection of the trappist monastery the theatrical representations of saint sulpice made him jump saint severin seemed to him distracted and worn how could he live among stupid people like the devout how listen without gnashing his teeth to the affected chants of the choirs how lastly could he seek again in the chapel of the benedictine nuns and even at notre dame des victoires that dull heat radiating from the souls of the monks and thawing little by little the ice of his poor being and then it was not even that 
what was truly crushing truly dreadful was to think that doubtless he would never again feel that admirable joy which lifts you from the ground carries you you know not where nor how above sense ah those paths at the monastery wandered in at daybreak those paths where one day after a communion god had dilated his soul in such a fashion that it seemed no longer his own so much had christ plunged him in the sea of his divine infinity swallowed him in the heavenly firmament of his person how renew that state of grace without communion and outside a cloister no it is all over he concluded and he was seized with such an access of sadness such an outburst of despair that he thought of getting out at the first station and returning to the monastery and he had to shrug his shoulders for his character was not patient enough nor his will firm enough nor his body strong enough to support the terrible trials of a novitiate moreover the prospect of having no cell to himself of sleeping dressed higgledy-piggledy in a dormitory alarmed him but what then and sadly he took stock of himself ah oh, he thought i have lived twenty years in ten days in that convent and i leave it my brain relaxed my heart in rags i am done for for ever paris and notre dame de l'atre have rejected me each in their turn like a waif and here i am condemned to live apart for i am still too much a man of letters to become a monk and yet i am already too much a monk to remain among men of letters he leapt up and was silent dazzled by jets of electric light which flooded him as the train stopped he had returned to paris if they he said thinking of those writers whom it would no doubt be difficult not to see again if they knew how inferior they are to the lowest of the lay brothers if they could imagine how the divine intoxication of a trappist swineherd interests me more than all their conversations and all their books oh lord that i might live live in the shadow of the prayers of humble brother simeon end of part two chapter nine End of En Route by Jody Karl Heismans, translated by Charles Keegan Paul.